Welcome to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada's webcast called COVID-19 Conversation with a Hematologist. In this presentation, Dr. Florian Kuchenbauer will provide an overview of current knowledge on COVID-19 and blood cancers. My name is Sonia Muto. I'm the Community Program Coordinator for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada. I will be the host of this online event. During the webcast, you will hear only my voice and the speaker's voice. The presentation will last approximately 20 minutes and will be followed by a 30 minute question and answer period. This presentation is also being recorded. So therefore you will be able to listen to it again on our website while following along with the PowerPoint presentation. We will send you an email when the recording is available. Next slide, please. At the LLSC, our mission is to cure blood cancers and improve the quality of life of those touched by a blood cancer and their families. We offer guidance and support every step of the way. Next slide. We know the current situation presents many challenges to you and your family. The community services managers can help. They are compassionate connectors that can help you cope with your anxiety and isolation during these times. You can reach out to a community services manager in your area by calling toll-free 1-833-222-4884. You are not alone. Next slide. We offer a variety of educational resources and support services. One such service is the COVID-19 Resource Center. We have great resources that you can access from home, such as fre frequently asked questions and different webcasts to help you adapt to this new normal. Next slide. We are also very proud of our brand new Your Life After Cancer program. This program, the first of its kind in Canada, was recently launched on June 2nd. It responds to the unique needs of our community and offers information, tools, and resources to help people affected by blood cancer thrive in this new chapter. This program was developed in collaboration with a committee of volunteers made up of Canadians affected by blood cancer. Several tools and resources are available, such as videos, webcasts, fact sheets, and even inspiring testimonials from people who have been there. Whether you are returning to work after treatment, struggling with brain fog and fatigue, or trying to adjust to a new normal, this program is for you. For more information, visit yourlifeaftercancer.ca. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Florian Kuchenbauer. Dr. Kuchenbauer is a clinical scientist at the Leukemia BMT Program of BC and Terry Fox Lab of BC Cancer. He is also an associate professor in medicine at the University of British Columbia. Over to you, Dr. Kuchenbauer. Thank you very much and a warm welcome from Vancouver to everybody who is listening. So I will start with a disappointment. So I'm not a COVID expert. So I had to read a lot to present, to make these slides, to put together some information because COVID hasn't been around for a long time. Information is diverse. There's lots of information and it's very dynamic. So this means for you, that I can only provide a snapshot up to today's date and everything that is thereafter can change. And that's why please keep this in mind. And, and if you find something interesting, information might have changed, facts might have changed because new research is coming out. But I would like to start to give you an introduction about um, COVID-19, about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is actually causing COVID-19. It's a little bit like um, HIV and, and, and AIDS. So this is a retrovirus, which is, um, sorry, this is a RNA virus, which is part of the coronavirus family. It has a 30 kilo bit genome and it encodes, it encodes proteases, RNA dependent polymerases and, and structured proteins. Basically everything that a virus needs to self-replicate. And one of the most important factors is the S protein, which you can find here, it's called the spike glycoprotein. And this is responsible to bind um, and to fuse with membranes of lung cells. And this also, this is the target for neutralizing antibodies here. The coronavirus um, family can cause colds, SARS and MERS. So basically it is a huge range. So some people are asymptomatic who are COVID positive. Some people have just a cold and some people can develop a really severe disease, which is life-threatening. So you see the spectrum of the disease is very big and the spectrum within the coronavirus family is the same. So you have simple colds, 
and you can have life-threatening diseases like SARS. The hosts of, of this virus are animals. I mean, it's believed that SARS-CoV-2 derives from, from bats. This is not 100% clear, but um, animals can, can transmit this virus. Another factor that is important for the virus itself, besides the spike glycoprotein, is the envelope protein. So this is basically a protein which helps to infect cells, so which allows the virus to, to infect certain human cells. Um, we use this in research quite often just to um, derive or to, to set up artificial virus systems. And then you have the matrix glycoprotein, which is um, very uh, abundant and which is a structural protein which also interacts with the viral envelope. Eventually, what you get is the virus carries RNA, not DNA. It's a single-stranded RNA, and it encodes for several um, proteins. Some of them are, it's not clear what they do, and then all the structural proteins you need or the virus needs to self-replicate. All these surface proteins here, these are the things um, people are trying to target when they develop vaccinations. So this is something to keep in to keep in mind. So what is the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2? So usually this this virus, um, when you inhale it and it's a it's a, when you inhale it and it goes through the lungs into lung cells, which we call pneumocytes, as as shown here. What happens is the S protein, the spike protein, binds to ACE2. So you might have heard of this. Uh, it has been in the press. And ACE2 binds the virus, and this is and the protease, basically it's a cleavage enzyme here, TMPRSS2. It basically cleaves the spike protein, and this allows the fusion with the membrane and entering the entrance of the virus into the host cells. And you can see that this um, all these different steps have been tried to be uh, to target. So for example, there's this. TMPRSS2 inhibitor um, already in phase one, phase two trials. Um, the viral fusion inhibitor, um, such as um, hydroxychloroquine, has been extensively discussed. Currently, the use is not recommended. So FDA recently retracted its um, its recommendation to to take it. And there are lots of clinical trials currently running to investigate the role of hydroxychloroquine. So what happens now? So the receptor, so the virus binds to the cell membrane here, and it's getting picked up by the cells. So um, you can imagine this is kind of like a like a air bubble which fuses with a big air bubble, and then the virus is inside the cell. The virus opens up, and and releases its RNA and some proteins. And this basically this combination here leads to the replication of this virus. So so it uses the host cell to replicate and to produce more RNA and more proteins. And this here, and these kind of replication steps can also be targeted. There's a drug which is called lopinavir, which has been tested and was recently published that it does not have an effect on the treatment of, of COVID-19. And there's also another viral inhibitor, which is called remdesivir, um, which was recently shown to have a benefit in very severe COVID-19 cases, but and it's usually used in cases which are on the ICU and have a very um, um, bad prognosis. That's when it's used, and and it was initially um, developed for other viral diseases. So um, a lot of these drugs are currently um, drugs drugs that are getting repurposed. And then once these structural viral proteins have been have been built a new virus assembles and is getting released. So you, that's how you basically becoming somebody who can spread the virus. Because the virus hosts in your, in your lung cells, replicates, and then again, it goes back out of the lung cells, new virus is produced. And so you can basically exhale the virus and infect other people and spreading it. So what's the clinical course of COVID-19? Um, well, once you start transmitting the virus, and this is primarily a droplet infection, and which can also be um, aerosolized, the symptoms are very diverse. So there is fever and, and cough and fatigue. These are like the main symptoms. This is what people, patients mostly tell us, and this is how they come uh, often enter the emergency room and say like, well, I have fever, dry cough, fatigue, and everybody is of course more aware that this could be maybe COVID related. 
interestingly, um, not it's, it's very unspecific. Could also be a cold. Could could be something else. So so these are the things where we have to think about: Is it worth testing? Yes or no? What are the guidelines? And this is based this is based on each province differently. And then of course you can develop like you have sputum pr production, you have dyspnea, um, you have a sore throat, headache, chills. So everything basically that could also that you could develop for a regular cold or a flu. Interestingly, um, what are the what are the things that are um, prevent the virus? And I will get to this later. But there was a very interesting article which was recently published in the Lancet where the authors looked into all the articles that have been published about hand washing, using hand drops, using facial masks, distancing, and all these things. They looked at it and, and tried to figure out what are the most effective ways of containing or not spreading the virus. And, it, and you know what? That, it comes down to simple things. It's really hand washing, proper hand washing, not just rinsing your hands, but you have to use soap. You have to use it for a certain amount of time. Hand drops, which are alcohol based. These are important. Use them regularly. And most important, distancing. That's that's what it is. And the authors here also concluded that distancing between one and two meters is, is effective. Another symptom, which I'll come to in the next slide, is actually um, clotting complications of this virus. So this is something rather new. When you look now at the different disease stages, you can see that you there's an incubation stage, which is usually um, around 10 or like 5 to 14 days, um, which can be asymptomatic. Then you have you can develop some symptomatic infection, which can be mild to moderate. This is when fever and cough and like these more general symptoms occur. And then this it's called the hyperinflammation stage. This is when people talk about cytokine storm. It's not really clear if it's a cytokine storm, um, but what is known that you the body basically reacts to, to the inflammation and produces in a defense mechanisms um, several proteins which are fighting the infection, but they can also cause side effects, which are then, um, so it's, it's a double-edged sword. And this is called the hyperinflammation stage. This is then more severe. And then, of course, you can develop, um, and then there's the resolution stage. And this is when it either works out for you or um, the body cannot contain the disease. And the problems that, that occur are acute respiratory distress syndrome, are um, ARDS sepsis and organ failure. And this is also the period where you have um, elevated inflammatory markers. So I just mentioned that COVID causes thrombotic or thromboembolic disease. So overall COVID is a, is a pretty new disease and, and the virus is actually can be quite nasty and can affect a lot of different organ systems. And something that is rather new is that we it was found that SARS-CoV-2, this virus, can cause clots in, in up to 20 to 30 percent of all the COVID-19 patients. So there are certain risk factors that um, are known to, to, um, to enhance this, such as um, if you're bedridden, like fever, diarrhea, so like for example, um, if, you, if, you're, if you lose a lot of liquid, if you're, this is, this is one thing, sepsis, liver injury, all these things can can help to promote clotting, and of course um, the hyperinflammation syndrome, which I just talked about, can also so lead to an inflammation, for example, of blood vessels in a very simplistic way, which can then cause clotting. And of course you have hemostatic abnormalities, which is like things that are um, that are built are uh, microthrombi, like small little clots that are in the lungs. You can also develop um, small little clots in, in other blood vessels. This can cause, um, this can affect your heart. And, and eventually this can affect the lungs with a venous thromboembolism. It can cause myocardial infarction. It also can cause a, what we call a big disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is a which is a systemic disease and can cause clotting and bleeding at different different parts of the body. So, so these are like quite complicated um, clinical outcomes and require a very specific treatment and an expert treatment. So one of the things when, um, so when SARS-2, 
came up and COVID cases increased, like here in Vancouver, my wife told me when we went to Costco and, and, and we had to wait in line and wear a mask. And after we bought the stuff, she said like, we have to wipe it off with Lysol. So we have to disinfect and clean everything that goes into the fridge and kitchen. And, you know, as a good husband, I did it. Uh, but I also um, questioned him and said like, well, how do you know? And so there were a lot of studies where um, scientists looked into what's the half-life of SARS-CoV-2 of the virus causing COVID on different materials. So for example, in aerosols, in the air, the half-life, and this means, half-life means that that's the time until 50% of the virus have disappeared is, is quite short, it's one hour. And on cardboard, it's actually three hours. On plastic, it's seven hours. So what 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 is there to be learned? And the first thing is, the wife is always right and don't complain, just do it. And she was right. So we wiped down every milk container, cleaned it. And this is um, important because on plastic surfaces, this is just the half-life. The actually the, the virus can remain up to a few days on plastic surfaces. And so, so it tells you that this is the virus is quite um, under normal circumstances, is, is quite resistant and and can persist. So really Think about cleaning stuff before you put it into your fridge, clean your fridge, clean surfaces. And that's why we are, for example, with elevator buttons in our institute, we are currently really trying to keep this as clean as possible. The other thing I want to mention is, what about COVID-19 in Canada? And I found some, there's a lot of information on this, on the WHO homepage, on the, on the, on the local homepages of British Columbia, on, on Canadian government homepages. So you can find lots on this, but what I wanna show is that the good, good news is that the daily reported cases are decreasing. But I mean, up to in the middle, like end of April and beginning of May, we had up to 2000 cases a day. And, and this is not, and, and you can imagine that not everybody got tested who potentially had it. So, so the numbers were actually almost likely higher, but this is a lot. And if you look at the distribution by province, you can see that the disease is actually um, driven by, right now, by Ontario and, and Quebec. So in Quebec right now, we've had um, 54,000 cage, uh, cases, and in Ontario it's around 30. 2000, whereas in BC it's only 2,700 um, cases. I mean, the, the, of course, the, the population density is higher in those provinces. The, it's, it's also like how testing is, is done in these provinces. So this is, the, there is, this is, the rules are different between each province. But you see, overall, Canada has developed, um, has, or has reported around 100,000 cases, whereas worldwide we have 7.8 million cases. That's quite a lot for, for this disease and, and within a short time. So this is basically from March to June. It's, 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 it's less than three months. Good thing is that the death rate or the fatality rate um, is, is also decreasing. So you see the daily reported deaths here in, in Canada. There was a peak time, end of April, beginning of May, where more than 200 deaths have been, have been reported daily. And, and that's a lot. And what was interesting is that the age distribution is, it's mainly the deaths occurred mainly in, this, in the age group from 80 to, or 80 plus basically. And this is the green line here. And you can see, this is the main population that has been affected by COVID. So basically frail and vulnerable patients. So the average age was, was above 80 of the patients who died of COVID. But if you take now a look and look at the fatality rate, so this is basically the rate of COVID case, detected COVID cases, and how many people died of COVID, you see the worldwide rate is 5.5%. Doesn't sound like a lot, but if you compare it to a regular flu, um, the fatality rate is less than 1%. So um, it's really much higher. And you can also imagine that this number is underestimated because not everybody and not everybody and not every country um, reports these cases. 
So in Canada, for example, the death rate is, or the fatality rate right now is, is 8.2%, which is above the worldwide average. And if you look at the different provinces, you can see in Quebec, it's nearly 10% right now. In BC, it's 6%. Alberta has 2%, but there's no reason to move to Alberta, Alberta now, just based on this. But what I'm saying is that these are very relative numbers. And it doesn't mean that Canada provides less, less care or the care is not good enough in Canada. It's just a way of how these numbers are acquired and, and reported. So please keep this in mind when you look at these numbers. It's, it's very relative and this will also change. So who's now considered as high-risk patient? And when you go to the Government of Canada homepage, you can see that it's, it's actually, actually quite vague. So you, um, so people with heart disease, hypertension, lung disease, diabetes, and cancer are mentioned. Are mentioned. Then people with weakened immune system, medical condition, um, from medical condition or treatment, such as chemotherapy, and older adults. So you see, it's pretty vague. And especially um, cancer is a pretty big thing because cancer um, is, a, is a basket with um, hundreds of different diseases. So I was wondering, is there any information out, out there about cancer patients and COVID-19? So I, I went out and, and started looking into this, and this is a very new field. So basically, I found three major articles which have been published recently. And these are articles that are basically recording COVID patients from maybe beginning of this year or from um, spring, such as March, until now. So there's very, you can see the numbers are small. There is very little information and each study has its own drawbacks because they're coming from different countries with different infection rates, different health systems. So there are only a couple of con conclusions we can, we can draw from these studies, but it's very interesting to see. Let's start with the first one. This study was, was published by Dai et al. in Cancer Discovery. And, and this was one of the first ones um, looking into cancer patients and, and SARS-CoV-2. So the idea of the study was to compare the outcome of COVID-19 positive patients um, that have cancer or have no cancer. And you can see there, they compared 105 cancer patients with 536 aged matched non-cancer patients. And what they, the authors claim based on their observations is that COVID-19 and cancer patients um, had much more severe outcomes. The patients with hematological cancers, lung cancer, or metastatic cancers, such as stage four cancers, had the highest frequency of severe events. Patients with non-metastatic cancer have similar frequencies of severe conditions compared to the patients um, without cancer. So, so metastasis seems to play a role or basically advanced cancer seems to play a role and seems to be a risk factor. And what was interesting is, is that patients who received surgery had a higher risk of having severe events, whereas patients who underwent only radiotherapy did not demonstrate any differences in severe events, and especially when they compare this to patients without cancer. So this is an interesting study, but these are like really um, like claims that would scare me. And when I read this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is terrible. So to better understand such a study, you have to go into the statistics and the numbers. And so this is a table which looks complicated, but I will guide you through this. So on the left-hand side, you see the cancer, the cancer types. And keep in mind, they only looked at 105 cancer patients. Here you can see the total number of patients. This is the total number, the absolute number, and these are the percentages of the cancer population. So let's go to blood cancer. They only included nine blood cancer patients. And these were patients that had, and I had to go to a supplementary file, which comprised, I think, like 30 pages or so. And these are patients with MDS, CML, lymphoma, multiple myeloma. So it's a mixed bed of blood cancer. So very difficult to actually make a statement about blood cancer because these are all completely different diseases that have different treatment approaches. What they saw is overall that the death rate of cancer patients is above the the worldwide average, so it's it's 11.4 percent, so it's twice as much as, for example, seen in the world with 5.5 percent right now. And you can see that because three patients died out of the blood cancer patients, they say like, oh my God, the death rate is 33 percent. It's really high. So the question is, is this true? I cannot tell you because there is no 
good database or study that only looks exclusively at blood cancer and then maybe at different subtypes of patients with uh, undergoing a transplant or not. These kind of things are not known yet, but this, this data will come out for sure. But you can see that um, within these patient groups, 44% went into the ICU and um, and they all had um, and they all the, the average time to to being critical was actually relatively short in these patients. So this overall it tells us that cancer patients might have a might be more susceptible in terms of maybe contracting COVID, although this is not really sure, and might potentially develop a severe disease course. So based on this, there's another study which recently came out. Uh, this is a study which was published by Kudera in The Lancet and also in 2020, and it's, it's pre-published online right now. And it's a registry study from the US, Canada, and Spain, and it's based on a COVID-19 and cancer consortium database. And what, these, um, what the authors looked at were um, the all-cause mortality within 30 days of diagnosis of COVID-19. And they included 928 patients with active or previous malignancy and COVID-19. So that's so this is a bigger patient number, but also the question is a little, is, is different. So the median age of, of the patient population was 66 years, and the most common cancer types were breast and prostate cancer, and approximately 40% had still active cancer, where you can find cancer sites in the patients. 40% of these patients also were on active anti-cancer treatments, such as chemotherapy. Interestingly, so the death rate here is similar to the previous study, it's around 13%. What, was, what I found striking is that approximately 60% of these patients were, have been never admitted to the ICU. So this raises the question, and it cannot be answered by this, by this study, but it raises the question, do, for example, in these countries have cancer patients less um, access to ICUs? Do they get less care? So, or because people say like, well, they have advanced cancer and we, our ICU is full, we have to prioritize, we have to, we have a triage system. So these are questions that should be considered when analyzing these, these studies and most of them cannot really give a clear answer. What was also interesting is that the risk, the risk of death was significantly associated with advancing age. So age is a thing that other studies have found this too. Being male, this is also something that other studies have found. Smoking habits, the number of comorbidities, and ECOG, which kind of is reflecting your, your fitness level. Active cancer, and interestingly, um, also the combination of acetylmycin plus hydroxychloroquine. So if patients received those two in combination, the outcome was actually worse. I don't know what this means, it's, but it was an interesting observation here. So when you look at the numbers here, 35% of patients received cytotoxic chemotherapy within four weeks before testing positive for COVID. And what was really, and, and I think this was one of the conclusions the authors drew, is that race, ethnicity, obesity, obesity were not associated with mortality. Cancer type, um, as well as cancer type and the type of anti-cancer treatment and recent surgery. So here, they, the authors claim that um, cancer type and the type of anti-cancer treatment does not have impact on this. Here, this is kind of like a summary in a, in a more graphical way. So what you see here is the mortality um, of different patient groups as a function of cancer type status and treatment. So here, this is just proportion with um, outcome, with the worst outcome. So you can see these are solid tumors and these are hematological malignancies. And these are solid tumors that are in remission or that have no evidence of disease. These are solid tumors that are, um, have stable disease, and these are the ones that have progressive disease. And the same for hematological malignancies. And you can see the ones with advanced and progressing disease are the ones with a higher proportion of um, mortality and with a worse outcome. Interestingly, chemotherapy, when you look at the same thing here, no recent chemotherapy, non-cytotoxic chemotherapy and cytotoxic chemotherapy did not impact. So there was no difference here between these three columns. So this tells us that um, the cancer type, how, I mean, eventually it reflects kind of how frail and, and how fit a patient is, depending on the disease and how advanced the disease is, play a huge role in outcome of COVID-19. 
The third study I would like to mention is a study from the UK, and it's a prospective observation study from the UK Coronal Cancer Monitoring Project, and it involves 800 patients. And this patients, uh, this study by Lee et al. was also published in the Lancet. It's, it's currently pre-published online. And, and they looked at 800 patients with a diagnosis of cancer and symptomatic COVID-19. Interestingly, here in the study, they classified patients depending on the severity, on the degree of the COVID-19. Of COVID so 52 patients had mild COVID-19 disease, 23 severe, and, and 22 critical. And 7% of these patients were in the ICU. It also tells you again, it's, it's actually a low percentage that, um, of critical patients that went to the ICU. So this is also something to keep in mind, as I mentioned before. Interestingly here, the mortality was really high. It was 28% of these patients died. And, the, and again, the risk of death was significantly associated with advancing age being male, presence of other comorbidities, and also cardiovascular disease. 35% of these patients received chemotherapy within four weeks before testing positive. And also here, it shows that chemotherapy in the past four weeks did not affect mortality of COVID-19. So, and there was no significant effect on mortality for patients with immunotherapy, hormonal therapy, targeted therapy, radiotherapy within the past four weeks before testing positive for COVID-19. And this is reflected in, in this hazard ratio in this, in this graph here. And you can see um, to the left means it's associated with um, less disease, less death, and to the right, it's with more death. And you can see the p-value, like the statistics, there's no statistical significance here for each one of the, of the listed treatments. And this gives you a little bit better, like a better overview because the, the, the study size, the study population, 800 patients is, 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 is different, but it also tells you it's from the UK. The UK is one of, um, had a lot of COVID cases within Europe. And, and the UK also had a higher fatality rate, for example, compared to Germany. So it tells you, or at least it implies that maybe the way how like cancer patients might be more, um, like say vulnerable in the UK for COVID-19. The reasons for this are not clear. Does it depend on the health system? Does it depend on the availability of ICU beds? I don't know, and the authors don't know either, but it, it basically, when you look at all these three studies, um, the summary is that, I mean, cancer patients have a worse COVID-19 outcome. So this is a frail and a vulnerable population. The impact, however, of chemotherapy is not really clear. So this is something um, which needs more clinical trials and, and observational studies. It is also not clear which chemotherapies have the biggest impact. Is it like cytotoxins versus immune therapy? Is there an impact? So these are all these little details which are absolutely not clear. And also like which cancer have has the worst outcome. The first um, trial or like the first study suggested that it might be hematological cancers. From the other studies, it's not, this is not the case, it's not clear. And it's also not clear what, what's the impact of immune suppression. So there's also, there are also ideas that maybe immune suppression can be protective in the, in the course of the disease in terms of that it maybe might decrease or diminish this hyperinflammatory um, phase of the disease. And the other thing that is also clear is, is that advanced disease might have a negative impact. So, so this is again, a frail and, and vulnerable population. Okay, so where, do you, where can you read up about these things? And I put together some, some guidelines and, and, and resources. So there's lots of information out there. The, Challenge is, and I have a slide at the end, is that this inf information is very dynamic. So for example, the um, information of the European um, Society of Bone and Stem Cell Transplantation, EBMT, they, their guidelines are in their ninth edition and they're constantly updated, which is really good. So it's a very dynamic process, how physicians and, and centers deal with the disease because there are more things that um, science kind of um, brings out. There are no more results and these results have to be implemented and our daily um, handling of the disease. So here are the ESMO guidelines, they are a little bit more specific towards different cancer types. For example, they have guidelines for multiple myeloma, for lymphomas, so you can look it up here. Then there are these guidelines of the American Society of Hematology, which I found really useful because what they did, they have basically an expert panel and they have, and they ask questions and the expert panel gives answers and they are all listed in here. So, so this is really, 
good to read and it's also um, you can understand it and there are the EBMT guidelines they, they I think they're great as well then of course the LLSC guidelines I mean LSC tries to keep up with all these new developments and updates their homepage frequently and then of course even though they have been bashed uh, throughout throughout the last months but the WHO is a great resource and it's a very, very important um, source of information and also institution for the fight against COVID-19. So um, please go and see their homepage. It's constantly updated and they also have a really nice page. It's called um, Mythbusters. So where they look at COVID-19 myths, like for example, is it getting transmitted through shoes and so on. So this is actually quite nice to read. The Canadian government has a good homepage to and has a section for COVID-19 and that's where all the recommendations um, for COVID-19 are posted and then of course the relevant medical journals which are for example the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, JAMA, Blood which is a bit more specific to and leukemia, BBMT and BMT so the last four are the ones where mainly blood cancers and transplantation related issues are posted. So what are the questions we got? So this was actually quite interesting to read what is on people's mind and, and what are the questions that are really urging people to, to know. When I see patients who undergo chemotherapy, I get a lot of questions about COVID and, and many of these questions I just cannot answer because I don't know and there's no like reliable data for most of these questions. But I try to, we, we try to group these questions and I try to put together some answers and also some resources that you can look into because they might change in, in the next two weeks and you can get your own um, idea and then discuss it with your, with your doctor of choice. Okay, most important thing, and I cannot stretch this enough, is do the five. It's not a dance, but <clears throat> this is the way to stop coronavirus. And it's very simple, and usually simple things are the best things, so wash your hands. So when I'm in the clinic, I think I wash like my hands 30 times a day. This is, is ridiculous, and uh, but, that's the only way to do it. You have to wash them and you have to be clean. What I'm teaching my kid all the time is cough into your elbow. Like kids don't do this, but um, kids can be carriers, so they have to do it. But then don't wipe your nose on your elbow, right? This is the other thing you have to teach your kid. Don't touch your face. I'm constantly touching my face. My wife tells me touching my face and I don't even realize it. So this is something, it's a habit which we have to train off. And most important, keep safe distance. You can meet with friends, but keep distance. Don't hug, don't come too close. Especially if you are not sure about um, if you are like a high risk patient or not, this is a really important thing. And then of course, don't go out. I mean, you know, this is all common sense. Stay home if you can, don't go, I mean, cinemas are closed, but uh, like avoid demonstrate like mass gatherings. Like we had, for example, in Germany, there were recently some demonstrations and, and they were I think these demonstrations were worldwide against like COVID measures. And um, interestingly, <laughs> they were some hotspots and they, these demonstrations became hotspots of, of spreading of, of, of the disease. So, so don't, don't go to Costco if you, uh, on, on a Saturday at noon if you, if you feel that it's not safe for you. So please be reasonable about this. It's all common sense. There's nothing special about it. Everybody can do it. Here, this is a good a guideline. So the WHO pasted, um, like posted formulations, how to make your own hand drops, and 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 also like it's it's really a recipe to follow. So if you are if you're good in chemistry or um, in pharmacy, um, have a look into this. And then of course, again, uh, maybe you have a look into this review. I, I mentioned it at the beginning. It's really they really looked into what is about all these measures like um, space distance, distancing and wearing masks and they show that this is these are the most useful things. I cannot stress this enough. It's, it's really important. So the first question block, I think this is what everybody's been waiting for and, and asking themselves why is this guy talking so much but um, the first question blocks are a question block is is stem cell transplantation related and the first question is is a survivor of lymphoma and an ontologous stem cell transplantation in 2010 considered at greater risk to become very ill of COVID-19? Second question is, would someone who had an auto BMT several years ago be at a high risk of getting COVID-19? So first of all, there is 
no data available on this. So there's zero data, and there's only a tiny bit of data, which I will mention later. But just from my personal view, view and, and this might change, and this is just a snapshot, and, and, and please take this for granted. If you ask five doctors, you get five different opinions usually. But I, I would say you're not. So if your transplant was 10 years ago, and you're not, you don't have any treatment anymore, you don't have a higher risk of developing infections, you don't develop more infections than usual. Um, if you not have had a, like a spinectomy, all these things have to be taken into account. I would say, no, your immune system should have been reconstituted. And, and, and one side of it is you, you should have um, kind of finished your vaccination plan. So, so I would say no here. The second question and the second question block to this towards this topic is is how deadly is this virus for a stem cell transplant patient? And my transplant was 15 years ago, and I'm not sure, and I'm not on immune suppressant drugs. Would I be considered high risk? So again, there's no published data on COVID-19 and the outcome on allogenic or autologous stem cell transplantation. However, um, when I was browsing through literature and recommendations from different uh, transplantation societies. There's some preliminary data which shows that there's approximately a 30% mortality in, for both allergenic and autologous um, stem cell transplant recipients. So this is based on an EDMT survey on currently 246 patients, and that's all they posted, exactly the sentence. So that's all I can say. There's no publication, no peer-reviewed um, article in any journal about this. So this is just an indication, but again, it tells us what we have suspected that. If you have recently undergone an allergenic transplantation or an autologous transplantation, you are at a greater risk of maybe severe disease. So um, you, you would count as a frail and vulnerable patient collective. So if my transplant was 15 years ago and I'm not on immune suppressant drugs, I, again, I would say no, your immune system should have reconstituted so far. I would not count you as high risk. However, be smart and do the five. Again, I can only emphasize this. But other questions to consider is, I mean, if you, let's say you underwent a transplant and you still suffer from chronic GVH, GVHD, even though your transplant has been many years back, this is something, then you're considered as immune suppressed. And for example, if your immune status has not recovered, then you're also considered as uh, being as immune suppressed. So again, you would fall into a high risk group. So there, are, so there are little details that matter and how I, as a clinician, would, would judge how to, like, how, to, how to handle COVID-19. Are you, like, in which category you would fall? And you can see here from this graph, which I, which I put together, is COVID-19 had a lot of impact on stem cell transplantation. So it impacted on donors. So for example, donors that were tested positive for COVID-19 out. These were not donors anymore. Um, patients um, in, in stem cell transplantation, it had huge impact. So visitors are not allowed. So these are all based on recommendations that have been posted by EVMT. And, and these are recommendations that, that have been picked up by each transplantation center and potentially modified. But these are just guidelines. But I'm telling you, COVID-19 had huge impact on, on our stem cell transplantation program in, in Vancouver, for example. And um, many people in Vancouver, like the head of the transplant unit and admin people, spent a lot of time implementing these guidelines for our patients. So this was really a, this is a big thing. Nurse, everything has changed. We are wearing masks, we are super careful. Um, patients cannot receive visitors. So, so it's, it's also stressful, mentally stressful for, for patients undergoing treatment right now. We've delayed a lot of treatment treatments and transplants, you can see, so that's why it, it affects transplant candidates. And also like the patients after HCT. So we have switched quite a bit to telemedicine, to not to expose people to the hospital environment. So you can see these are, this is big impact. And a lot of people have worked on this, nurses, doctors, just to keep this into, to, to make it a safe place for, for patients. So COVID-19 is unfortunately the new reality and, and that's what we have to get used to. Question block two, survivors. So I'm in full remission, do you know if I'm at high risk? 
are leukemia survivors at greater risk of complications if they contract COVID-19? Am I still considered immune compromised after treatment from 2011 to 2013? Okay, so, so towards the first question, remission alone is not a criteria for immune competence. So um, this, I, I cannot answer this question. It's, it's, it's not clear. I, I don't know the details, so I cannot give you a, a satisfying answer on this. Then um, leukemia survivors, it's not clear. There's no data available on this, unfortunately. So it really depends how long your disease was back. Are you still on immunosuppression? Are you, um, all these things are details that matter to categorize, are you high risk or no? And then um, I, I think the last question is, is like a no, your immune system should have been reconstituted as, as I mentioned previously, but also this here depends on the treatment. Was it, um, was it like a stem cell transplant? Do you still have GVHD? Was it just chemotherapy? I don't know these details. So hard to give an answer on this. So if you have these questions, best will be discuss it with your, your hematologist or oncologist because they know best your treatment course. Question block three, vulnerability. Having CLL with no symptoms is my, is my immune system a big issue during COVID-19? So I put together some slides based on the ASH guidelines. And I also found some interesting publications on CLL and treatment of CLL and COVID-19. Second question is, do blood cancer patients have a high risk of complications due to COVID-19? So um, go back to, my, to the beginning of my talk. So here where I presented all these different articles and, and studies towards cancer patients, but overall, um, I would say yes. Besides vulnerability due to being immune compromised, are there any other vulnerabilities because of blood cancer? So it's not clear, there's no data on this. It's a really new field and, and most of these publications came up within the last three months. So, so more will be published throughout this year and then, and, and then these questions might be answered, but right now I, I cannot. What kind of precautions should we be taking day to day? How vigilant do we need to be with staying home? My daughter will be working in a day camp this summer. What precautions, uh, what precautions should I take vis-a-vis -vis her living in the same house? So, so these are actually complicated questions because um, they're complicated and not complicated. So if you do the five, you're already good. But the things that are relevant is, for example, within Canada, you can see that um, most cases are in Quebec and Ontario. So these are, and if you, and these are, and it depends where you live over there. And um, if you live in a small town where there are no cases, then your the likelihood is, is less and, and you're most likely to be, you're fine. But it really depends where you live, what's the surrounding, are there lots of cases, what's the testing situation, lots of details that are relevant for evaluating your risk and um, of contracting COVID-19. So that's why stick to the five and, and, you, and this is the best you can do for now. So CLL, I found this a quite interesting topic. So COVID-19 and hematological malignancies. So based on these ASH COVID-19 frequently asked questions, there is no evidence for high incidence of severe COVID-19 in patients with CLL compared to patients with other malignancies. However, in areas with high prevalence of COVID-19, the recommendations are to postpone treatment initiation if possible and minimize, of course, the number of, of hospital visits for those who are stable and, and doing well. So this is important. In patients without COVID-19, we only continue, and this was one of the, I quoted this from, from this conversation which was posted, we only continue IVIG treatments for highly selected patients with a history of hypogamma globulinemia inactive or recurrent severe infections where the potential benefits are outweighed by the risk of coming to clinic for the infusion. So what this means is that um, you, have to, you always have to, you have to think about what's the risk of coming to the clinic, being exposed to physicians who have contact with a lot of other people, being um, exposed to maybe patients who have COVID-19 or who, are, who carry the virus and are asymptomatic. So this is, this is important. So this is, these are kind of individual decisions. And the other thing is that the current IVIG treatments you get, they will not contain um, antibodies uh, against COVID because it's so new. So 
maybe later this year or next year, when you get one of these IVIG formulations, it might even be protective of COVID-19. So this is something to, to keep in mind. Then there's currently, there's not enough evidence to suggest that the approach should be different for specific class of targeted CLL drugs and decisions regarding holding or continuing treatments are made on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is, this is when I, what I meant when I mentioned um, treatment decisions are based on your individual situation. So it's very difficult to say like, if you have CLL type A situation B, then we do C. It's, you should discuss this with your hematologist and then go through the pros and cons and then make a decision on how to proceed with your treatment. And what I found really interesting is that there were recently some record, uh, reports published that are talking about a possible benefit of PTKs like glutamine tyrosine, tyrosine kinase inhibitors such as ibutinib or ekilabutinib in the setting of severe COVID-19 infections. I mean, these are small publications and I prepared some slides for this, but um, it's, it's very interesting to see. And regardless of that, it still needs, or it's lacking controlled studies. So, so there are no randomized studies showing that this might be a benefit. These are more, in, these are, I guess, more considered as indications. Okay, so there's, there was this publication in Blood and, and I found this really, when at first I read it, I was like, oh, but it's a really interesting one. Um, so what was published here, it's a letter to blood. They published that they had in their clinic, they had six patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulin anemia, which were tested positive for COVID-19. So this disease here basically is like a, it, it, it's kind of like a um, myeloma related disease. And, and five of these six patients received Ibrutinib at the regular dose of 420 milligrams per day, and one patient had it at a lower dose because of some comorbidities of 140 milligrams per day. All these patients developed a cough and fever, and the five patients on the high dose or like the normal dose Ibrutinib with 420 milligrams, they did not like experience dyspnea and did not require hospitalization. And so they, they improved really fast and had a resolution or near resolution of COVID-19 during the next follow-up period. So, so this was a very um, positive cause of disease. Interestingly, the patient on the reduced dose ibrutinib experienced progressive disease and hypoxia, prompting hospitalization. So this patient had then further worsening conditions and actually underwent multiple treatments. <coughs> and all these treatments, including some of the drugs which I mentioned at the beginning, did not help and this patient became worse and worse and worse. And, and, and then at some point, the physicians decided to restart ibrutinib, but at um, a regular dose of 420 milligrams. And, and this led to the rapid improvement of this patient. So this was quite striking. And the way they described it, I, I was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. So this report, it's only actually one patient out of six that where ibrutinib showed some treatment respond. So please take this with a grain of salt. This is an observation, nothing more. But it raised the question, does a BTK inhibitor protect from COVID-19 induced lung injury? And there was another um, study where the authors looked at Achillabrutinib, and um, which was also recently published, um, showing similar results. But it's not a controlled randomized study. These are just a few patients. But the idea behind it is that Ibrutinib or like a BTK inhibitor, modulates the inflammatory profile of these patients. So it impacts on macrophages, on, on cells that are modulating or changing or like are responsible for, the, for inflammation in the body. That's basically what it is. It seems to impact these cells. And in this case, um, in a positive way. So I found this really interesting. And with this, I'm coming to the last question is, how do cancer patients with COVID-19 get treated any differently than the general public? Well, the answer is yes. So being COVID-19 positive and just being, just having COVID-19 around, even if you're not positive, it impacts on the cancer treatment because all the algorithms have been changed. It impacts on treatment start, treatment intensity, and it also imp impacts on are you treated as an in or an outpatient? 
So these are things that are, um, are every hospital developed guidelines on these questions, and but it's not the same as it used to be, and it, it and it will not. So as long as COVID nineteen is around, this is the new reality that with which, with which we have to deal. So so this is really um, things have changed drastically in a very short time, and we have to get used to it. Unfortunately, also for us physicians, it's it's challenging, and so it is for nurses, social work for everybody. So we are all in the same boat and we have to work with it and make the best out of it to keep patients safe, provide the best treatment and continue to do what we can, what we do. So what are the challenges now? The challenges for me when I put together this talk were, first of all, there is not enough data. So, so this is why this lecture might be a bit frustrating for you because I just cannot answer every question. And and even if I try to answer a question, I might not have enough data to give you a scientific sound answer. I can only give you maybe speculations, observations, but nothing that is really, really scientifically sound and has been confirmed in multiple clinical trials. The data is also very dynamic. So, so things that we initially thought that are relevant, I mean, at the beginning, I got emails from friends who asked me about, oh, what about vitamin D? Is vitamin D protective of COVID-19? And then nowadays, nobody is talking about vitamin D anymore. So things are changing. And there's a lot of publications. And, and, and because everybody really wants to contribute and wants to do something good and, and help, but it makes it very difficult to navigate to this kind of jungle. And because it also impacts on the quality of the publications. So some of these publications are not of good quality because journals try to think they have to publish them to give, maybe to help patients, but they have not been properly peer reviewed. Some of the ma like major publications have been retracted, for example, in the, from the New England Journal and The Lancet have been recently retracted. So this was actually quite shocking. For example, a study on hydroxychloroquine and its impact on, um, on patients with COVID-19. Other things like, can, can patients be treated with an AC, AC2 inhibitor? There was a study that has, has been retracted. So, you know, it's, it's a very dynamic field. And, and this makes it really difficult to figure out what is right, what is wrong. Some publications are on the internet, but they have not been peer reviewed. They just, people just posted them. And, and I read them and I was like, okay. So, and then I look up like the journal and it says, well, it hasn't been peer reviewed, but we wanted to post it because maybe it might help patients. So these are the challenges. There's a lot of misinformation. And then of course, like the press picks up everything. So, um, I mean, maybe leaders of, Big countries give ideas to inject, for example, um, disinfectants or to take hydroxychloroquine. And you know, you would think that these people would say these things because they have been advised, they have a lot of medical advisors, it's but it's not always clear. So everybody tries to help, everybody tries to, you know, put a like bring a piece of the puzzle together, but it's not always right. And the other thing is, for example, like two days ago, there was this huge hype about this clinical trial coming from the UK about dexamethasone, about its, its, um, that it could basically help severely sick COVID-19 patients. So when this came out, and it was on every newspaper in Canada, in Germany, it was really worldwide. But there hasn't been a publication. Nobody has seen the data. The WHO has seen some of the data on, and it's that's what they posted on their homepage. They they are pleasantly surprised, but there's no publication so that I could look at the data. So that it hasn't been peer reviewed by other scientists who are expert on the field. So you can see even small things like like everything that provides a glimpse of hope is picked up by the press and provides hype. So um, if you read things. Discuss it with your doctor and be critical. That's my advice. And as I said, everything I'm provided today might change tomorrow. It's very dynamic. Lots of information is still undergoing evaluation and will be published hopefully soon so we learn more about it. But still, I hope that this talk could give you a little bit of insight on what is currently being done for cancer patients on COVID-19, what is known, what is not known. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And very important for me is now, please donate to cancer research. Currently, our because of the economic crisis, all our grants have been canceled. We are not getting money. Many 
cancer research labs have to close because always remember, cancer will stay, COVID-19 will pass. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuchenbauer. Um, I, I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge today. Um, I know it was difficult to find some, some information, but it was very well presented and I think you was very much appreciated. Uh, we'd also like to thank um, our partners who were able to make this webcast happen today. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank all our attendees for coming in and listening today. Uh, although we did not take any live questions, please note that I will make note of these questions and we'll be sharing those with the community services managers for some, for some information. If you can change the slide, please. So just want to remind everyone not to hesitate to contact the LLSE if you need more information or support. You can reach us by email at canadainfo at lls.org or toll free at 1-833-222-4884. Also, make sure to check out our website regularly to make sure so that, sorry, to watch all our past webcasts and for the dates of our upcoming webcasts as well. I'd like to remind everyone that a short survey will be sent out to all participants after this webcast. We would greatly appreciate you taking a moment to fill it in as it will help us to offer you the most valuable information in the near future. Thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful day and stay safe.